I'm Frank Bardicke and I live in Watsonville. And it's just, it's, it's just a Watsonville story. And I'm not in touch with the um, farm worker community the way I used to be. I have a couple of, I, have, I know a lot of ex-farm workers, people my age are not working that much in the fields anymore. And so this is a, the story I'm going to tell is that I'm confident of, okay. but there's a whole lot of stuff that goes on in the fields that I don't know about. So that's a disclaimer. Um, the situation in Watsonville is now is that there is actually an authentic shortage of labor. Um, the militarization of the border has made it more difficult for people to go back and, and forth. And so there is not enough workers in the, in the uh, Pajaro Valley. Um, the Pajaro Valley is at the head of the Salinas Valley. And that's been true for the last couple of years. And uh, what's happened in the Pajaro Valley is what the local people call la mora, or the bushberries. The bushberries are making so much money these days that um, they put a whole bunch more bushberries in. And the bushberries, to work in the bushberries, you don't have to bend over. The bushberries are about, like up about here, and you can, you can kind of stoop a little bit, but you don't have to bend completely over to pick them, like you do with strawberries. So traditionally, the, bush, the bushberries have been lower pay than the strawberries. But now there's been so many bushberries, they're so popular, they're making so much money off it, making that, um, that uh, and there's a shortage of labor, that the people who, who uh, the employers in the bushberries raise the wages. They raise the wages because there's a shortage of labor. That's kind of like a basic, you know, rule economics. They raise the wage, unless workers are like in a Bracero program or something like that where legally you can't, you don't raise the wages. If they can get out of it, they'll try to. But ordinarily, if there's a shortage of labor, if there's actually not enough workers to go around, which has been the case in the Pyro Valley for the last couple of years, then wages will go up. So the, the people who grow the bushberries raise the wages. They raise them up to the level of the strawberry workers make. All this is piecework. Um, uh, it varies a whole lot depending on how good the berries are. You're talking about 10, 12, sometimes even more bucks an hour um, uh, over a season. So what happened was people who are going to do a job that's completely bent over versus a job that's just a little bit of stooping and who are not, you know, strawberry workers have been strawberry workers for a really long time and really know the tricks of the trade, those people went to the bushberries. Right. So there, wasn't, there weren't enough, there weren't enough um, uh, uh, workers in the strawberries. I mean, there were places, they were disking fields. Um, they were working people that were working 12, 14 hours a day because they didn't have enough workers. And they were disking fields. Well, what happened, is what you would predict is that the um, wages went up in the strawberries. The strawberry growers started paying as much money as the, as the bushberry growers were paying. I mean, paying more, paying more to hold on to their, hold on to their workforce. Everybody's wages went up except the company that had a UFW contract. And the company that had the UFW contract, they told the workers, well, your wages can't go up because we have a contract, which of course is not true because if the grower and the union agree, of course they can uh, change the way, uh, uh, terms of the contract whenever they feel like it, if they both agree to do it. But the UFW wouldn't fight for that, and so they told the workers that, um, that uh, they couldn't raise the wages up to the level of all everybody else's strawberry all the other strawberry workers. Plus, in the UFW, you're taking 3% out of your check for union dues. So you're making, if you're working a UFW contract, yes, you have seniority rights, which is extremely important, especially in this really hard work where you can you know, get old, and uh, if there's no seniority rights, they're, they're done with you. So seniority rights is not an insignificant thing. There were seniority rights, but the wages were lower than all the other strawberry workers in town. Mm -hmm. So, People struggled and fought, and they organized a desert election. This was last year. And they had the desert election, and there were so many challenges of the desert election that when it was, when the vote happened, um, the uh, ALRB doesn't, didn't count it. They, they um, sealed the boxes and didn't count it. 
So at the beginning of this season, and this is as, as late as I know it, because the people I talk to about this, I haven't talked to them lately, and because I'm not following the, I'm not following it the way I used to follow it. Um, the last thing that was happening was that there were sort of daily walkouts at the UFW farm where the vote was un, was sealed because people were still making less money than people were making at the other companies. So. In some respects, in some respects, um, uh, time is really ripe. Mm -hmm. Time is really ripe because always, you know, a shortage of labor is a time when uh, you know when you can really build something. In, you know, ordinarily among working class people, um, the 1965 strike wave came because um, the Bracero program ended that year, and the um, the workers were like um, they were slow to replace. They were slow to replace Braceros with uh, green carters and illegals. So there was a, over the statewide, there was a shortage of workers, although not particularly in the table grapes, because the table grapes had never used Braceros anyway. Right. Um, so, um, so there's an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I also, you know, when you're talking about this, there's probably not too many farm workers who are watching this, you know. Um, so, if something's going to happen in the fields, it's going to have to really start with farm workers. Yeah. Going to have to start with farm workers. Other people, other people can help once things get going, you know, or people could maybe help an organizing committee, but the organized committee has got to be like farm worker based. It's not going to come from the outside. And you know, lots, I used to, I don't do that much anymore, but I used to talk quite a bit when I, was, when I went around talking about my book. And people would often, at the end of the, of the end of when I was talking, they'd say, well, Frank, what, what can we do to help farm workers? What we could do to help farm workers? And my response to that was, you know, they're closing the libraries. The schools are a mess. You know, you know the minimum wage is like, you know, one half of what it should, if, to make it equal to what it was in the 1950s. Um, uh, the society's falling apart. There are plenty of places to fight. If you want to fight, you don't have to go fight somebody else's f struggle. Now, when farm workers get moving, when farm workers get moving because of the nature of farm work, because of the isolation of, of, of farm workers as a part of a class, they need help. They need help. And they can come to you and, you know, seek help from the kinds of people who are maybe seeing this video. But, but they can't, you can't do it for them. And if you want to fight, you can find some places to fight in your own neighborhood, in your own backyard, on your own job, in your own school. Right. So, anyway, that's my little and sermon. how would this SB 744 affect the farm workers? I don't know what it is. That's the immigration reform with the... Uh, oh, well, you know, a Bracero program, a Bracero program, a guest worker, all guest worker programs, the point of guest worker programs is to um, put a lid on wages. Mm -hmm. that, that's the point of them. I mean, um, <laughs> that, that's why they exist, to put a lid on wages and also to kind of maintain some kind of control over the working class. That's what they're about. Um, uh, uh, well, why would the Farm Workers Union be supporting this program? Well, I, don't, I, I can't give you an, a, a, a certain answer, but my guess is is because they're hoping that there'll be some kind of checkoff, union checkoff, and they'll get the dues. Um, from the guest workers. That's that's my guess. The fields and I am these days. Now, the Filipino. What experience did you have with Filipino workers when you were working in the fields? Well, there was a uh, Watsonville has a long, uh, uh, rich uh, Filipino history. Um, in the in the um, 1930s, before the Second World War the basic workforce in the fields in Salinas and Watsonville was, was Filipinos, not Mexicans. Mexicans didn't come in until the Second World War. There were a few, but um, there were a few Chicanos and there were, some, there were a good number of uh, Okies and, and some uh, blacks. Before, um, say 1965, 1965 is a good, a good year. It's the year that Johnny was born. I mean, it would have been, um, so we we'll use it as a landmark here. Before 65, the fields were really a lot more diverse. California fields were a lot more diverse than they are now. Um, there are, um, now, you know, 90% of the, 
of the people who work in fields were born in, Calif in Mexico or Central America. 90% of them. Um, uh, an interesting thing is 50%, the last time we did these counting, 50% of the people who are, work in the California fields are the children of farm workers. Mm -hmm. So how does that go together? 90% are from born outside of the country, but 50% are the children. And the answer is, is that they're children of Mexicans raised in Mexico, who then come, children of Mexican farm workers raised in Mexico and then come work in the fields, replace their dads or their uncles. Um, uh, so um, anyway, what was where was I? The Filipino role of the Filipino. Oh, uh, oh, okay. No, I know. I was on the diversity. So in 1965, there were actually all different kinds of people who worked in the fields. Um, there were uh, Mexicans. There were Chicanos. There were Filipinos. There were Tejanos. There were uh, African Americans. There were whites. There were Hindus. There were a lot of different kinds of people and. Over time, that became pure Mexican immigrant, but at that time, it was very diverse. As a matter of fact, that's the major reason, there, well, there are two major reasons that Chavez tried to start the National Farm Workers Association in Delano. One reason was there was a lot of work around there because table grapes is a year-round, nearly year-round operation. But the second reason was because that particular place, there were Chicano workers as opposed to Mexicans. And um, they didn't call them Chicanos at the time, they called them Mexican-Americans. And people in Delano don't call themselves Mexican-Americans, they call themselves Mexicans. But there are people whose parents and grandparents came in the 20s. And, um, and there are what we, would, what we think of as Chicanos. And so when Gilbert and, and, uh, when Gilbert and, uh, and Caesar and Helen started the NFWA, Dolores wasn't really there at the very beginning. When they she, she was at Paywalk at that time. Yeah, right. She wasn't there. She, she says she was, but she wasn't. But um, uh, when they started, they're all Chicanos. They're all, I mean, Caesar's grandfather voted in the United States. I mean, you know, he is Chicano as you, I mean, you're talking about third generation born here. They're all Chicano, so they wanted to organize among the people like them. So they, that's a major reason that they, that they started in, um, that they started in Delano. In any case, in Watsonville, before the Second World War, the workforce in the fields is Filipino. And there were many strikes, and um, there was also a, a, a murder that became very famous, and it was a famous murder um, in Watsonville. He was shot in a bunkhead while he was asleep, shot in a bunkhouse while he was asleep. Um, uh, it was in the midst of a strike, it was right after a strike. There was, um, there's a really fine movie that I recommend to people um, but by Jeff Dunn. It's called uh, A Dollar a Day, Ten Cents a Dance, where... Um, Tobera. What? Tobera. Tobera, yeah. Um, Furman Tobera. A martyr. Uh, uh, a um, Filipino martyr. Um, uh, so, Watsonville... There was a, well, like, uh, do you want me to tell you a story of a strike in 1934? All right, I'll tell you a story. <laughs> um, I haven't told this story for a while. Uh, in 1936, I don't know if, you, if you, people remember, but in 1936, there was a big strike in Salinas, um, which got national publicity. And it was called, um, and the nation said, fascism, fascism comes to Salinas. And, um, it was a, it was a, um, it was a strike of um, of shed workers. In those days, the lettuce was cut in the fields, put in wagons, and then the wagons were taken to sheds, and then it was packed in ice in sheds, and then put on a railroad car and taken across the country. People might know this from the movie East of Eden, because um, one of the leaders in that movie invented the ice. Guy stuff. Um, so, there, so the Filipi the, all the work in the fields was being done by Filipinos, and the work in the sheds was being done by whites. So, in 1936, there was a big strike, very famous, written about in many places. Carrie McWilliams writes about it. Lots of people, Steinbeck writes about. It. A lot of people write about this 36 strike because some 
a, a guy by the name of Colonel, whatever his name was, I don't know, a vigilantes came into town and took over the town and brutally put down the strike. Well, in the fields, it turned out, even though it was a shed worker strike, the Filipinos continued to cut the lettuce. So what was the story there? Well, the story was in 1934, and that was the way they busted the strike, basically, because the Filipinos continued to cut the lettuce. In 1934, there was an earlier strike that nobody writes about. In the 1934 strike, there were four different units. There was a Filipino farm worker union, the FLU. It was in Salinas. It had one branch in Salinas and had another branch in Watsonville. And then there was a white shed workers union and one branch in, Sal one branch in Salinas and one branch in Watsonville. Those four units, those four units went out on strike together for, for better wages and for union, union recognition. And they made a pledge when they went out on strike together that nobody would settle, that nobody would settle unless everybody settled. So I'm trying to remember these names. I haven't told the story for a while. I'm trying to remember these names. So the strike began. It was a very powerful strike. Both people are out now. The shed workers are out. The Filipino union's out. Very, very strong strike. Production shut down. Nothing's moving out of Salinas. I'll tell you one other really interesting thing about this strike. Inside the sheds, they had a thing called the split bench. These are, these are white workers. Inside the shed, there are male workers and there are female workers. Okay, so the, the, the lettuce would come on these, the lettuce would come in these big um, bins and it would be dumped on a line. And the, the Filipinos in the fields, they're not like today where you actually uh, uh, trim the lettuce in the fields. They would just cut it and throw it into, a, into this bin. So it would be dumped on the line. And the women, the women would trim the lettuce. This is iceberg lettuce in the back in those days. They would trim the lettuce, make it ready to be packed into a box. And then the men would pack it into a box and load it on. This is before forklifts. I don't know if anybody out there has worked in a factory, but can you imagine a factory before forklifts? <laughs> can you imagine what it, how much work there was? So anyway, so then the men would carry, <laughs> carry these boxes and put them in the refrigerated rail cars. And actually, they did it so that they did it so that um, so that um, the the line was set up the bench is what they called it. The bench, because it wasn't a conveyor belt, it was a bench. The bench was set up, so it was right next to the railroad track. Okay. Salinas in the, in, in the 1930s used more ice than New York City. More ice than New York City because there was so much lettuce was being packed in ice, put in refrigerated rail cars. So the, the bosses had devised this system where the women who are trimming the lettuce are paid by the hour. And the men who are packing it and putting it on the railroad cars are paid by the piece. <laughs> this was called a split bench. So what it happened is, and of course, these are their husbands and brothers and fathers and sons and boyfriends and, you know, men and women from the same community together. So what would happen, I mean, everybody out there is worked by the hour. You work as slow as you can. Everybody out, I'm, some of you out there have worked by the piece. You want to work as fast as you can. So <laughs> there was this constant tension and argument and problems between the men and the women. Because there's a split bench. So one of the de there are three basic demands. Well, there's four d basic demands. One demand was higher wages. Another demand was union recognition. Another demand was um, uh, numbers of hours and overtime because there's a lot of arthritis, tremendous amount of arthritis. And, uh, and the last demand was no split bench. They wanted to get rid of the split bench. So the strike is very strong, goes on for a really long time, and. A guy from San Francisco, and he from the AFL from San Francisco. He's a fa famous guy. He comes down to the Salinas Valley, 
and huddles. He's from the, he's the head of the San Francisco Labor Council. He huddles he huddles with the white shed workers, and he convinces them to um, take a settlement and not to worry about the Filipino unions. So a settlement is offered, which gives recognizes recognizes the shed workers union and gives nothing to the Filipino union. And so there's votes, there's four votes, and even though ahead of time there'd been this agreement that we all go out together, ahead, um, the, the shed workers, narrowly, the shed workers union votes to go back to work. And, um, and then there's this very brutal, um, the Filipinos vote to continue their strike. And then there's this very brutal attack on the Filipino strike. People are run out of town. The, um, the Filipino hall is burned down. Um, and their strike is totally defeated. And, um, and um, the shed workers, the shed workers get a significant concession. That's what happened in 1934. Okay. 1930, slowly 35 people come back in the field, the Filipinos come back to work. They're the workforce in those days. They come back to work, but defeated, their union defeated. In 1936, when people come up from the Imperial Valley to the sheds, around the sheds are barbed wire fences. And there's a, the, the Shed Workers Union, which had been granted recognition, is, is shut out, locked out. And it's first come, first serve, and they bust the union. And that's when they bring in this colonel, whose name I don't remember. Lots of people's names I don't remember. They bring this, that's when they bring in this colonel, and that's when the shed workers strike really hard, and that's when um, the becomes this famous strike. Now the shed workers went to the Filipinos in the fields and say, "Come on, we're on strike! Solidarity! Solidarity!" Well, you know, <laughs> our memory ain't that short, you know. And unfortunately, I mean, it's a sad story. It's a, it's, it's a very sad story, but you know. Um, one nationality, ethnicity, scabbing on another ethnicity strike, that's the common rule in California agriculture. Mm -hmm. That's, in fact, what has happened more often than there's been solidarity between ethnicities. And that's why the 65 strike, the birth of what we come, to, what came to be the UFW, was such a beautiful and significant thing, because that began with an act of solidarity by a Mexican union in support of a Filipino union that was already on strike. Right. And you know, it went bad. We know that, but at the at, at its at its inception, it was something quite rare, and something that's to, back in the day totally necessary in order to build a union is to have un unity among the different ethnicities who work, who, who are working in the craft that you're trying to organize. And farm work, by the way, is a craft. Um, so, I don't know. I don't know if there's any lesson there, <laughs> but um, that's, that's what happened. <laughs>